Okay, so um, I'll start because um, what we did this week, obviously, with, you know, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we decided to start um, launching um, how we wanted and you had encouraged us to um, use the language reconstruction um, with regard to flat closure. And so we wanted to just um, be able to have like, a be, uh, our beginning topic of you explaining yet again to us why using that terminology, specifically flat closure reconstruction, um, will be helpful um, for people moving forward. Yeah, I've kind of thought about this a lot. Um, so I think there's a couple reasons why it's important to use the term uh, reconstruction. So I think the first point is that um, you know from a um, from an expectation standpoint for patients, I think it's very important for patients to feel like uh, a flat closure is in fact a reconstruction, because part of what we're trying to achieve here is an aesthetic, proportional, even um, you know, symmetric closure. And that's essentially our goal with any type of breast reconstruction. I always start off my breast cancer reconstruction discussion with four main points. And the first point of those four is, our goal here is to get you as normal and balanced and symmetric as possible um, in clothes, without clothes, or know you've had some type of reconstructive surgery. I think those same you know, principles apply here. That if our end point, if our goal is a normal, balanced, even symmetric, outcome in my mind that's a reconstruction and i think it also sort of sets up a conversation with the surgical oncologist the breast surgeon that this is not simply an ablative surgery that this is an ablative and a reconstructive surgery and if that conversation um, is sort of made clear from the outset that flat closure is a reconstruction that's almost like a trigger for the breast surgeons to say, oh, okay, we're gonna get a plastic surgeon involved here. Whether at the time of the mastectomy or at a later date, that's sort of the, you know, the signal that uh, this is a, a oncoplastic type procedure, meaning you have an oncologist and a plastic surgeon involved. And then um, the last part I'll say for uh, um, the insurance piece is if it's sort of coded as a breast reconstruction, if it's sort of pre-authorized as a breast reconstruction, it will kind of come under the purview of the Women's Health Care Act of 1998, which says that, you know, reconstructive services are uh, a federal mandate in the context of a breast cancer uh, diagnosis. Wonderful. Yeah, we, we've, had, we've had a little bit of confusion and, and a little bit of um, pushback with regard to people have been really kind of um, proud of saying they opted out of reconstruction. And so it's uh, it's gonna be something that we're going to have to get used to and to encourage people to start encompassing, looking at themselves is using, um, you know, the terms flat closure as a reconstruction term rather than no reconstruction. So we're glad that you helped us with that and and um yeah we we're we're hoping to continue to encourage people to change the language that they use when they go to their um surgeons so. i can see that there would be some you know confusion that i don't want a reconstruction i guess the flip side is also true that by using the term breast reconstruction you don't want to set up the conversation with a plastic surgeon where they're trying to convince you into a reconstruction. I think the point here is that flat closure is a reconstruction. Like when I ask for a flat closure, that is my reconstruction. So I'm not really asking for implants, I'm not asking for deep flaps. Flat closure is the reconstruction. So rather than um, talk to me about other reconstructions, let's talk about this reconstruction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thanks. And we're, yeah, we're really, proud that you've helped us with that a lot and um yeah it's it's gonna be good so good. and so Sandra, on our last video we talked about um quadrants of the breast
Yeah. Can you explain the difference between quadrants and regions of the breast in terms of a surgical like surgical perspective? Yeah, I think um, in this case, we're really talking about quadrants or regions of the chest wall. Um, because again, the, you know, the assumption is that we've had a mastectomy and we're looking at a flat chest wall. And I tend to uh, break it up into, I guess, essentially, um, you know, four quadrants. So the first is kind of the upper chest, you know, let's say above where the nipple would have been or kind of the, um, from the clavicle to almost like the third rib area. The second is from like the third rib to maybe the sixth rib, the more central aspect of the chest where the nipple would typically be. Um, and then the third part is kind of the lower part of the chest where the chest transitions into the abdomen. And then the fourth part is kind of out to the side, um, the trunk area. I think each one of those areas has to be treated a little bit differently. You know, I think the problems with those areas are also fairly individual. So in the proximal part of the chest, sort of the top third of the chest, that's where you have a transition into the clavicle. That's the part if you wear a lower cut, cut blouse, you know, if there's some indentation deformity, it's more noticeable there. Uh, in real thin women, you tend to see the rib faces. Um, in the central aspect of the chest, oftentimes if you've had a skin sparing mastectomy, which is uh, usually the case, and someone's had a flat closure, that's where you can have some scar indentation. That's where your scar rely, uh, lies. That's where you'll have some retraction deformity of the scar. The lower part of the chest is kind of where the tissue is naturally a little bit thicker and it's transitioning into the abdomen. You almost have like a little convexity there. So rather than the concavity, you're dealing with in the central aspect of the chest, you have more of a convexity. And in some people that can be more pronounced. You know, the more pronounced your rib cage, the more that convexity is apparent. Um, for people that have a, you know, concave chest and a relatively, you know, uh, let's say scaphoid abdomen, sort of a, a bigger abdomen, you can imagine how that sort of transition from concavity to convexity can be, you know, a problem. And the last part is the lateral chest area where there's always a fair amount of hanging tissue. And part of the reason that happens is that when the mastectomy is done, a lot of those soft tissue attachments that attach the lateral trunk to the, um, you know, to the muscular fascia are released. And so that tissue just sort of hangs away because the normal anatomic uh, attachments have been um, ablated at the time of the mastectomy. And so that's oftentimes an area where people have a lot of discomfort. Uh, when their arm rubs against their side, um, they can feel uh, the um, relatively numb inner arm surface contacting this relatively numb lateral chest wall. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling for patients. So those are kind of the four areas in my mind that have to be addressed. And you know, how you address them and to what you address them really kind of depends on people's anatomy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So would, would, with regard to the different, and oh, we didn't prepare for this, question but it's just something that has made me think of it so because you know i i'm the one in the group that had just a unilateral mastectomy with regard to that it seems like there is just a like i don't want to say one size fits all but i i feel like we've seen we see the same scar pattern mm -hmm. um with unilateral mastectomy specifically rather than when people have bilateral is there a reason why so the um just kind of rephrase the question for me people have the same scar for unilateral mastectomy as they have for a bilateral mastectomy it seems like there's more versions of scar like how they do cut into somebody with regard to when they're having bilateral as opposed to unilateral. So um, it seems like, and I could be wrong, but I, I always see the same 
the same cut line with regard to unilateral, whereas with bilateral, we've seen all different ways of. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I never really thought about it in that way. I think that's probably true. Um, and I think that the reason for that, I think, is that when you have a bilateral situation and you're trying to match, let's say, the left side to the right side, mm -hmm. um, you want to kind of optimize your incision pattern so that you can, you know, have the greatest potential probability for optimizing symmetry. Okay. The problem with a unilateral mastectomy is there's really almost no way that you're going to optimize symmetry. In other words, it's very hard to make a right, for example, mastectomy look symmetric to a left contralateral breast. So there's almost, almost no matter what incision pattern you choose, there's going to be so much baseline asymmetry that I think breast surgeons probably default to whatever will give them the best oncologic outcome. And that's sort of a skin sparing, you know, traditional horizontal mastectomy. Yeah. I'm making a couple like leaps of assumptions there, but I think that's a I think that's probably what's going on. Yeah. So rather than trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to get the best symmetry? They have decided, well, there's really not much we can do in this situation. You know, there's a volume difference. There's a skin difference. Let's just go with the most oncologically sound incision, which is a transverse mm -hmm. traditional mastectomy incision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mel Melanie, you had a question. Did you want to? My question is, <clears throat> um, how does the position, I'm sorry, I'll start over. How does the position of a tumor in each of the different regions affect how a surgeon goes into the breast to remove the tumor? And what does that mean in regard to the type of scar a patient will have? Yeah, I think that, um, the scar position is many times independent of the tumor location. But I say many times because sometimes it's not. And a lot of that has to do with how close the tumor is to the skin margin. So in patients in whom the tumor is very close to the skin, oftentimes the breast surgeon will want to remove a component of the skin to establish a clear margin. Um, so not only are they removing the, the breast from the surface of the pectoralis fascia, but they're also removing it from the adjacent skin. And what they don't want is the tumor to be very close to the skin. And so in those settings, they'll remove some skin. If they're going to remove some actual skin because of proximity to the tumor, well, that'll affect their incision planning. For most patients, though, the tumor is not stuck to the skin. And if you're going to do a complete mastectomy, the ability to do a mastectomy should largely be independent of your incision pattern. So in other words, really through any incision pattern, one should be able to perform a complete mastectomy. Now, obviously the longer the incision, the easier that, that it is, you know, the more central the incision, the easier that it is. It's why the hardest type of mastectomy to do is a nipple sparing mastectomy through a relatively narrow incision <coughs> at the inframemory fold. It gives a good cosmetic outcome if you're going to do a, you know, tissue or implant reconstruction. It's a difficult mastectomy to do. But even through a relatively small incision, uh, relatively remotely located, a good breast surgeon can do a very complete mastectomy. It's only in the setting where the incision has to be planned um, due to a tumor uh, inherent to the skin that you would then change the incision uh, pattern. That's kind of a long-winded explanation. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I specifically wonder about this area right here. Like, so my scars are here. And this area does not have any scars. I have two separate scars. And oftentimes in our community, I see women with a single scar. Yeah. And when I went into my consult with my breast surgeon, 
she let me know that one, my scars would not be straight. And two, I would have two scars. There was no two ways about it. So like, I didn't really question. I was just like, okay, two scars. But now that, you know, like I'm nine years out, I have seen many surgeries, uh, uh, like enough surgeries to make me question why some of the women that I see have one single cut all the way across. So I was wondering just about that specific area. I'll tell you what my feeling about that is. I, I think Katie just joined us here. Hi, Katie. Um, Hi, Katie. My feeling about that is I personally, I don't like the single scar across the chest. I don't like it for a couple reasons. And then I'll qualify when I do like it. So I don't like it just kind of aesthetically. For me, like having that scar all the way across your chest, it's a very kind of like unnatural look. It almost looks like somebody who's uh, had, you know, a deep flap or a tummy tuck and the belly button dies and mm -hmm. you don't have a belly button. It's just odd looking sometimes to not have a belly button. It's a little bit odd to have a scar across the chest. I think from a functional standpoint, having that band can also be a little bit restrictive. So, if there's no um, if there's no discontinuity to that scar, and you've got a scar band across the chest, and people take a deep breath, you can provide some limitation because it's an unbroken band of scar. Mm -hmm. um, so, given the option, I don't like to do what's essentially a symnastia, which is one uh, one connected scar across the chest. Now, the times when I think you may have to do it is people that are very large breasted have a lot of excess skin and you decide to do a more traditional uh mastectomy and as you're working in that excess skin it's got to go somewhere and it's hard to get it to stop short of the midline in those people i think it's much better to do a wise pattern type um closure sometimes you know, we'll call it a goldilocks type approach where you'll uh, have the inverted T um, to reduce a lot of that skin redundancy. But I guess to answer your question, you know, for me personally, given the option versus a single scar versus two discontinuous scars, I tend to opt for two dis discontinuous scars. But I'm curious what you think because I've never really had this discussion in this detail with patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I personally, I thought that the reason why the my breast surgeon had said we will have two scars is because I had uh, breast cancer in my right breast. And I thought, you know, having one continuous scar might mean that uh, cells from my right breast went to a different area during the surgery. I, mean, I think that's a legitimate concern. You know, I think that's probably, um, I think it's a legitimate concern to think that, but I don't know if that's the issue as much as for me, the, the, the number one issue is the functional piece, uh, the scar band across the, across the chest that's not interrupted. Um, you know, you can almost think of like a cord across your chest, whereas if you have two cords that are not connected, well, there's more kind of flexibility, pliability to it. But mm -hmm. one central cord, it's much more restrictive. So the, uh, the first piece is the functional aspect. The second piece, is I just don't like the way it looks, like one continuous scar. Makes sense. So I have another question. If you were talking about concavity versus like it kind of poking out. So if there is concavity in between like three and six, how do you fix that? How do you manipulate the underlying tissue? Yeah, I think there's a closure appearance. There's a, probably a couple ways. The first uh, technique that I use a lot is what's called deepithelialization. So if you have a little uh, excess skin, you can almost you know borrow from Peter to pay Paul. You're removing that surface layer of skin and almost folding the dermis, the under layer of skin on itself to double up the area of concavity to make it less um, concave. I'll oftentimes use sutures to kind of 
position that folded in piece exactly where I want it to be. So it kind of lays relatively flat. Um, and the second piece is always fat grafting. You know, fat grafting uh, would not be done typically at the time of the mastectomy. And it goes to what we've talked about in the past where for fat grafting, you need a potential space, not an actual space. So when you have a mastectomy, you have an actual space there. And if you just place fat into that actual space, it, it doesn't take. Um, so you need a potential space, which is a kind of a healed space, that you can then balloon the fat into. And so fat grafting will be done three months or so after the mastectomy. And that's another way to deal with the um, area of concavity in that central aspect of the chest. So I don't know, Katie, do you have a question? I don't have a really good question. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. I, I downloaded everything right. Um, I don't know what questions you already got to, but um, there were some things and my area was about lymphedema tonight. So if we're ready for that, I don't have my questions in front of me, but um, a couple of my questions were about lymphedema is, are you finding that there's patients that are getting lymphedema because of the different areas that the surgery actually takes place in? Is there a type of the, it's not in front of me, but is there parts of the surgery that is going to make the chance of lymphedema worse or better? Yeah, lymphedema is a complicated... In regards to scar placement, where the tumor is. Yeah, lymphedema is a, a complicated question. You know, I think that the first part of this is there's lymphedema, which is defined by swelling in the arm and forearm and fingers. But that's a deceptive definition because some patients will have swelling not in the forearm or the fingers, but have swelling in kind of the upper arm portion here. Um, that's very common. We don't traditionally treat that with sleeve mm -hmm. compression um, and massage therapy as we do patients who have more distal extremity, fingers and forearm lymphedema. The other piece, which I think is very much under discussed is chest wall lymphedema or, you know, kind of this chronic lymphedema at the side of the chest oh, kind of goes to that. That's, that's what I have. Yeah, that zone four stuff that we talked about. Zoom. So I think those are okay. traditionally the way we think about lymphedema, but I do think that that is lymphedema also related to the mastectomy. Now, I and just like all the things we've talked about, I think that the way these things are treated really is based on where the deformity is. Uh, but to answer your question, what are the things that increase your chance for lymphedema? Well, the ones that are pretty well accepted are a axillary lymph node dissection. So if you need to have the lymph nodes removed because the tumor has spread to the lymph nodes, that markedly increases your risk for lymphedema. The mean onset of time for lymphedema is about 18 months. So, um, that's when patients start developing swelling in the hand and forearm. Uh, the risk of that is increasing if you had an actual lymph node dissection. It goes from a central node where the risk is about 3 to 10 percent, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent with an actual lymph node dissection. The other variable that really makes it very concerning for lymphedema is if you need radiation treatment. So, in other words, if you have um, three or more positive lymph nodes, and they recommend radiation treatment, your risk for lymphedema goes up even more. So the two variables that are very significantly um, impact, that very significantly impact lymphedema are full action lymph node dissection and radiation treatment. Other things that are associated with it are obesity, you know, body mass index in the mid to upper 30s or above. Um, and those though, are the more traditional lymphedema that we think of when we talk about sleep compression and uh, manual decompressive therapy um, affecting the arm and the fingers. Um, 
when it comes to the upper arm area and the lateral chest, you know, I, I see that a lot in patients that have just had a mastectomy without necessarily actually looking at the section or radiation. I see that a lot in patients that have had central node biopsies. Um, and I think it's a combination of lymphedema in the chest wall or arm, as well as kind of numbness that goes along with it. Sometimes hard to tease those apart. Um, what the, how much of the feeling is related to numbness and how much of the feeling is related to lymphedema. You know, if you examine somebody and it feels more full than the other arm, you know, there's a good chance of some chronic lymphedema there. We've had some really good success with liposuction for people that have some baseline lymphedema there. Um, liposuction, I think, works really well for the arm, for the upper arm. It works, you know, actually amazingly well. Um, for the chest, I don't know if liposuction works quite as well. What works best for me is just kind of cutting out that tissue. So there's another scar there, but actually removing that kind of loose hanging tissue seems to work the best for that sort of um, low grade chest wall lymphedema. Okay, that's good to know. Can, can I back up and ask a question about the quadrants? Sure. It, it seems like in the breast cancer community, um, there is a lot of dismissiveness about like the shape under the arm and dog ears that occur, uh, that that patients express having experienced with their doctors. So is the terminology of having quadrants, four different quadrants, this is a normal thing that patients can use to discuss with their doctors the shape of their body? This is known terminology? No, not really. I mean, to be honest, like what we're talking about here today is not something that is ever talked about. You know, in my experience, like flat closure is not an entity that is thought about in a academic fashion, in a, um, you know, in a surgical planning setting. Um, it's why I think it's important you know, I think it's very important what you're doing. And it's also very important to um, refine the conversation. You know, as we've seen a lot of patients have had issues with implants for many reasons. Um, and I think that as patients understand their options, um, flat closure is a natural option, but it's not one that plastic surgeons and breast surgeons fully appreciate. It's also one that I can understand, you know, the dismissiveness because from a technical aspect, it's not really taken that seriously. You know, it's not like you're, um, you know, doing an actual lymph node dissection or you're not, you know, doing a microvascular anastomosis for a deep flap. So from a technical aspect, it's not challenging, but that doesn't mean it isn't difficult. Does that make sense? You know, just because something isn't difficult to do doesn't make it hard to do. So something can be relatively easy from a technical standpoint, but hard to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think kind of understanding um, the chest wall, it's the same way we look at the nose. And I think rhinoplasty surgery is very complicated. In fact, it's probably the most complicated area in plastic surgery. And we break up the nose into the upper third, the central third, and you know, the, the tip and the lower third. And then the fourth area is like the sinuses and the top one. So it's sort of a similar way to think about it. And I think if you think about it in that type of a um, algorithmic way, it does force you as a surgeon to... Um, Think about solutions if you're thinking about it in more of a pattern fashion. That's why I kind of, you know, um, came up with this quadrant uh, thought process because in thinking about this and when we were talking off our last conversation, Dr. Kojak and I were talking about this whole um, process and we both said it's very much like the nose and it's very much the way we treat the subunits of the nose. Um, and these are the subunits of the chest, essentially. Mm -hmm. Someone just stopped. 
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they had yeah. lost Erica for a moment. Yeah, we did. And I, I see that maybe we lost Kim or Katie too. Yeah. Um, and so kind of to follow up with Melanie's question, is this something that you guys see a lot with people that are coming in even with revision that have requested flat closure that they do have that kind of dog ear? Yeah, I think I think the dog ear, standing cone deformities, you know, excess skin is very common. Um, and it's very common for, I think, practical reasons. And it's very common for, um, Sort of communication reasons. So, practically speaking, you know, particularly in someone who's, let's say, a higher body mass index or has had a, a you know, large pendulous breast, it's hard to get all the way around to the back without repositioning the patient in the OR. So, to do okay. that, you have to, have to actually, you know, remove the excess skin, reposition them on their side, break down the drapes re prep and drape sterilely, and then continue the operation. So that takes an additional 20, 30 minutes maybe. So practically speaking, that's you know sometimes hard to do. And um, it's a reason why people are probably less inclined to do it. Um, I think from a communication aspect, you know, I don't think that surgeons necessarily appreciate how problematic uh, that is for patients. You know, most breast surgeons, again, their primary concern is get out the tumor, deal with the lymph nodes, establish what the patient needs for chemotherapy, understand what their the indications are for radiation treatment. So on their priority list, this is way down on their priority list. Um, mm -hmm. It's why kind of thinking of it as a breast reconstruction takes that burden away from the breast surgeon and says, just like for any reconstruction, Listen, I'm going to deal with the breast cancer. You, Mr. Plastic Surgeon, Mrs. Plastic Surgeon, you deal with the reconstruction. You make it look, you know, good. I'm going to deal with the other piece. And I think that's a, it's a fair division of labor. Yeah, I think that I think that even when we're speaking with people about this, we sometimes forget to really make it very clear that it's super important for you to have a consult with a plastic surgeon. I think the problem lies in the fact that a lot of women refuse seeing a plastic surgeon because they are fearful that they are going to get talked into something that they don't want. And so therefore, I mean, in actual fact, in my own case, I refused to have a consult with a plastic surgeon because I was like, I don't, you know, in my naivete, I just did not want, like we say, any reconstruction. And so therefore I didn't see the point in going to a consult with a plastic surgeon. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people that do go see a plastic surgeon, they are still talked into and they feel very pressured when they do see a plastic surgeon to have breast mount reconstruction. Yeah, and I think that's that is definitely an issue here because I think um, and that's a I think a communication gap and it's an education gap. Um, I think that patients do have to be their own best advocates and you know the, from the plastic surgeon's perspective he or she is trying to make sure that the patient has all the options you mm -hmm. know that they have a full understanding of what their options are and the the one point i always make when i talk to people is that flat closure is a reconstructive option just like an implant-based reconstruction is a, a reconstructive option just like a deep flap is a reconstructive option you know it is an option um, and then the decision is yours, you know, in our discussion for the next hour or so to figure out what the best answer is for you. So then with regard to women who have dog ears, um, like what do you suggest that they do if they don't find that their surgeon when they go back and discuss how unhappy they are, what do you suggest that they do about that? Um, you know, seriously. Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, 
You know, I think that it's patients are in a difficult position to feel like they have to convince their doctor of their wishes. That's not a win-win for anybody. And even if the doctor is open to it, um, I think that there's a it, it, there's a power dynamic issue. There's a comfort level issue. There's a language issue. Are people able to express exactly what their concern is? It's why you know I think that having you know patients um, have access to a list of plastic surgeons who you know quote unquote you know I don't want to say believe in flat closure but um, are advocates for flat closure is important because then there's no convincing going on. There, mm -hmm. There's a lot in patients who have concerns with their implants. You know, a lot of patients are told that, you know, their implants are fine and if they're not feeling well, it's not related to their implants. You know, I think that the science is not crystal clear to me about uh, the impact of implants on some of these connective tissue disorder issues. And I think that if a patient is in a position where they have to convince their plastic surgeon that they want their implants removed, that's already a difficult dynamic. So I see a lot of patients who are coming to me because I've, you know, sort of established I've got an open mind for this implant um, illness uh, issue. And I think that the same is true with flat closure. I think all patients are really asking for is that their plastic surgeon have an open mind. And, and it, having access to those people makes the conversation much less tense and anxiety provoking and scary. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will say that just for me personally, after having all of these conversations with you, I mean, I feel so confident and good about sending people your way. I appreciate that. But there's, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that would be interested in, in having an open mind. It just isn't something that is really talked about in plastic surgery. Now there's, you know, there's financial motives, why people don't do it. There's all those other pieces. I mean, let's not be naive to that. Um, but, you know, I don't also want to perseverate on that because I don't think that that is the primary motivation. I think the primary issue is this kind of, you know, communication gap. Do you have suggestions on how we can change that conversation? Or uh, yeah. you know, where where we might uh, get best access to creating that conversation? Yeah, I think the best way to do this, and it's something that we are starting to do. So, you know, what we are doing is we're putting all our flat closure patients in a registry, and we're looking at them um, in a kind of from a research based you know uh, angle. You know, Dr. Kojak hasn't been on these calls that much, but you know, he's a he ran an NIH-funded lab. He really understands kind of the um, scientific approach to evaluate our outcomes and to um, and to put this forward in the plastic surgery literature. And I think, from an academic standpoint, that's the best way to deal with this type of an issue: is to get it out in the literature. You know, we just had the American Society of Plus Surgeons meeting in San Diego, and there was a big panel on breast implant illness. You know, three years ago, there's no way there would have been a panel on breast implant illness. Right. I think this is similar. You know, I think that getting the conversation going, getting patient communities advocating for themselves, developing a social media presence, and then finally getting this into the literature so that plus students can read about it, you know, I think is the right way to do this. Um, so, you know, right now, we're trying to put as many people as we can in our registry. Um, so uh, it's something that takes time, obviously, because we want to have a, a reasonable number of people. I think we'd like to get at least 100 people in there before we publish anything. 
So these are well, your individual patients that you are uh, putting into a database. That's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to so step away for one second and grab my charger because my computer is about to die. Hold on one second. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So, so with regard to that, with with regard to, um. Well, first of all, with regard to your your list, are you are you needing help with having more people on that list that aren't your patients, or are you you're specific you're specifically trying to utilize your own patients? No, database? the more patients we have, the better. So, if we were to go to our community, do you need do you need actual patients, or do you need reference of patients no i mean the bet the, the the key is to be able to um have pictures pre-operative and have pictures post-operative mm -hmm. and then if we take this kind of quadrant based approach to the chest wall kind of break down you know if there are four quadrants right we need a certain number of patients in each cohort you know i'm estimating uh -huh. about 25 patients in each cohort um, to be able to then compare them against each other, have kind of pre-operative and post-operative pictures. So uh, these would be people that we would have operated on. You know, a lot of times it would be a delayed reconstruction. That would be the the ideal. Um, but if there are people that have their pre-operative and post-operative pictures and they were operated on elsewhere, I think that would qualify. And it would be, you know, it's obviously a, a blinded registry, HIPAA compliant, it's, you know, de-identified. Um, just like all our pictures are. I I have before and after pictures. So. Yeah, I think that's I think that's important um, to uh, correlate. You know, the big sort of uh, buzzword in medicine is outcomes data research, and so outcomes in this context means um, comparing preoperative and postoperative pictures, but very importantly, correlating that outcome with the procedures that were done. Okay. So we are we are working on a few things, but I don't think we want to have them posted on <laughs> online of what we're working on right now. But sure, um, with regard to language. So, Katie, did you did you want to add anything, or she's been in and out? Poor thing. My rural. Is was really, I'm my ruralness is messing with me. You guys are in and out. It started out really good, but I'm sorry. I've, I, um, what would I like to add? Oh, lots of things. <laughs> um, I, before you guys get off, I know you've been on it for a while before me. I really want to say thank you again for the time you've given us, how much you've educated all of us and i'm so excited that you are working with us it i really am grateful thank you no it's my pleasure i think it's a it's interesting because from you know and I, was, I can't hear anything <laughs> I, I was an academic surgeon for for seven years you know, both dr project and I, our backgrounds are academia and so i think this if i were still you know a professor at ohio state this would be a really interesting area of research to kind of like you know go through these just exactly like we talked about today and I think it's one of those areas where there isn't a lot of academic research. I think it's a very, very opportune time to look at it from that type of, you know, academic standpoint. And I think if you do that, everybody benefits. You, know, you, you educate surgeons, you develop algorithms and protocols, and it becomes more of a serious, quote unquote, serious issue, one that's less apt to be dismissed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I missed so many of the questions before, but I know next time I, I do have some questions unless you, it's actually getting, but well, we've been here for a while. So I will save them until next time. Um, but it is, you know, when you are in college, when you are learning this stuff, I'm really curious as to how this moves into the classroom at this point, at this juncture. 
Um, Cause it seems like my kids are now at college age, a lot of them. And if any of them were going into the surgical realm, especially in this type of surgery, it'd be very, I'd be very curious to know what's being, what's being talked about. Yeah, I think so. this is the type of thing that, you know, people would learn at, as residents, you know, in their residency for surgery, right. um, either breast surgery or plastic surgery. And, you know, to get it to that point, it, you need academic, you need academic, um, you know, publications and, you know, it's something that people can talk about in their journal clubs. And that's the way sort of stuff makes it from, you know, um, the more theoretical to like the everyday practice. So if we see any of those articles, can you forward them on to us? Yeah. If I, if I write any of them or if I see any of them? See any of them. Yeah, I'll take a look. Um, we'll do a PubMed search and see. I would be surprised, to be honest, if there is an article on this, but um, I may be wrong. We, can, I, I mean, we want to get this information to doctors. We want it utilized. So it's just, it's important to figure out how to get that done. I'll take a look right now. I'll do a, a PubMed search while we're talking. So when I we we were at uh, the Young Survivor Coalition um, Breast Cancer Conference in Austin in March, and one of the studies, um, one of the topics was sex after um, mastectomy and breast cancer. Yeah, and so they pulled up and you know did their you know, talked about their research of, you know, satisfaction with their relationships after, um, after cancer. And the only things that they had comparative were lumpectomy and mastectomy with breast can mm. breast mount reconstruction. And they didn't even, when I asked why they didn't include flat, he said, well, they probably didn't even think that it was relevant. Yeah, that's a great anecdote for... And, and the fact is, is that we know personally from our own, you know, all of the people that we hear from is that there is much more likelihood of people having problems sexually after having breast mound reconstruction than going flat. So it's been kind of frustrating with regard to that in changing the language as, you know, using the excuse of you're not going to be happy sexually unless you have breast mound reconstruction. Yeah, that's a, I don't know where that data comes from. You know, it sounds more like it's just a, an assumption based on patriarchy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, just a, I just did a PubMed search. Um, for flat closure mastectomy, and only one article came up, and it was in the female to male transsexual population. That's a question I've got. Why don't female to male surgeons speak with mastectomy surgeons about outcomes? Say that one more time. Why is there a divide between surgeons who yeah. provide uh, transsexual female to male surgery and mastectomy with with or without reconstruction? Yeah, it's a great question because um, the uh, it's essentially a flat closure. You know, in a, in a person who's transitioning from a mm -hmm. woman to a man and you're doing a flat closure, um, I mean, that is to some extent a flat closure. You're retaining the nipple um, oftentimes and trying to give a more masculinized masculine masculinized chest um, but most people that do transgender surgery they're not necessarily doing a lot of oncologic reconstruction and vice versa if you're doing a lot of oncologic reconstruction you're probably not doing a lot of transgender surgery because they're all I mean there's a lot that goes into transgender surgery you know it's these are whole programs um, that can be very complicated in terms of the types of surgeries that are done. So most people that are specialized in transgender surgery, that's kind of all they do. 
<laughs> I just I just question the aesthetic uh, outcomes that tr trans people can obtain compared to what I see within the mastectomy and breast cancer community. Yeah, it's, it's also a little different. Not to interrupt, it's a little different because a mastectomy is very is is a different. The goals of a mastectomy are different mm -hmm. than the goals of a transgender female to male reconstruction. You know, the goals are different because one is more ablative. Quite frankly, you know, the mastectomy is is for oncologic reasons, whereas the transitioning surgery is more for aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would I would think that they're not they're not concerned with removing breast tissue like with a mastectomy. They're not as concerned. They, they're, what they're more concerned about is the contour of the chest wall. So mm -hmm. at some level, you want to leave some breast tissue behind because mm -hmm. you don't want to have a concave chest because mm -hmm. that's not masculine. Mm -hmm. This brings up, this is funny because Sandra and I were talking about this today and we've discussed it in group two and, and I was going to save it for next time, but it, it brings up about nipple sparing mastectomy with a flat closure. And is that, is it possible? Why would you do that? Is it taught? And how often have you had somebody ask you about that with with a flat closure. <laughs> yeah, I, have, I have a lady from uh, the West Coast who I'm going to operate on, and she had asked me for um, a nipple sparing flat closure. And okay. I essentially talked her out of it. And I talked her out of it for a couple <laughs> reasons. The first is she'd already had a mastectomy on the other side, which was okay. a seam sparing mastectomy. So you'd have a nipple on one side, not a nipple on the other side. There's some inherent kind of disproportion there. Number two, mm -hmm. from the nipple sensation aspect, you lose sensibility to the nipple once the mastectomy has been done. Okay. And, uh, I've had many people who retained the nipple and have actually come back and said, "Can you just take the nipple off?" Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from a from a you know technical standpoint, it's actually a lot more difficult to okay. do mm -hmm. nipple sparing flat closure. Um, so it's not something that I would typically offer patients because, again, I've had many people come back to me, even after nipple sparing mastectomy to reconstruction, and ask for the nipple to be removed. Okay. I didn't know if it was from a cancerous point, location of tumor, um, blood supply loss, aesthetics, all of the above. Um, it's, it's really, it is all of the above, and a big one is nipple position. You know, the nipple oftentimes ends up in a very odd position. Odd position, because and, of the scar line, right? Right. And so because the nipple's in an odd position, again, it begs the question, if it's not in the right position, it's not sensei, you know, what is the advantage of having it? I think there's yeah. not a lot of visuals on it. No. And so as you are thinking about... For me, I had reconstruction. My nipples were spared. Everything was lovely. I actually had a reduction. I'm sorry. When I went into reconstruction, it wasn't something that they saved. So when I actually explanted, it was a question I had. Like, is there a reason that I would create nipples? Or is at that point, I couldn't nipple spare, but it came up. Unfortunately, my plastic surgeon said, "Oh, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to have that chest look like a, a man's." And and that may have been the wrong thing for the answer, but he he actually, I went, "Oh, okay." It wasn't. I didn't have the response that you had, and so I kind of got, I got, I, I was kind of curious. I was like, well, is it going to look like a guy? You know. Anyways, yeah, the, I digress. The issue he kind of put me off. And of course, he wasn't. He he didn't suggest it. I didn't have any visuals. Yeah. That's a tough one. Again, I, I'm going to turn to you folks on that because I'm coming, you know, I, I've never had this in-depth conversation with a patient or patients on this specific issue. So my, my default has always been nipple position is going to be difficult to determine afterwards. Um, and it does make the operation more technically difficult. There's no doubt about that. 
I like that answer. I had, I had one person that I know. I like uh, that answer. I can understand that. That had nipple sparing flat. She she had a flat closure with nipple sparing, and then re because she wasn't told, and she was not aware that her nipples would permanently be hard, and so she then had to do stuff to hide <laughs> her, you know, to try and hide her nipples that were always hard so like she couldn't she couldn't wear just you know like most people are excited about being flat just because they don't have to wear a bra and she was like oh my god it's just a nightmare that's that's very i hear that commonly for patients that have had a nipple sparing mastectomy um and a reconstruction because they'll say you know they're always kind of they're obvious when i wear a t-shirt or something like that mm -hmm. yeah that was that was my only thing that I could note that I knew of somebody that had had um, nipple sparing to like flat nipple sparing. So I so wanted nipples at first. <laughs> <laughs> it just hurt my feelings that there were no nipples there. Well, you can always reconstruct a nipple afterwards. <laughs> Put it in the right position. We got googly eyes. <laughs> yeah, we do. We use googly eyes. We're we're good with it now. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because well. we we don't see that in the black community. I've been reconstructed for seven years, and in the breastbone reconstruction community, we do see that where there's like a formation of of a new nipple, and then they get the areola tattooing, but. In our in, in our flat groups, we don't see that people do that. But I wonder if that is actually because our I mean, until very recently, most people like when they were getting their surgeries, there wasn't that much care taken to people going flat. There, I, I could be wrong, but so when you have like somebody who has a jagged scar. That's a judgment there. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just slapping a judgment right on somebody's bare chest. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, see? <laughs> we have to bring humor somewhere. Yeah. So does anybody have any other questions or? I think we've done pretty the well. Velcro. This has been really interesting, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be here again. So we were we were wondering if maybe we could um, have flat closure now have some guests next time that would be um, for diversity's sake. So um, we're thinking of trying to find um, maybe uh, somebody who's male, um, somebody a few African American, maybe some people that are either Filipino. Um, of Asian descent that because we can talk about how different skin is in that regard. Yeah, I think that's a whole other topic that we haven't talked about, which is mm -hmm. helix formation, hypertrophic scars, scar management. I mean, that's a big part of this. I mean, the fact is that we're just a load of white chicks. So, <laughs> you know, what do we know about that? I mean, it's it would be really great for some other people to come on and have these kind of conversations with you about different ethnicities and, and you know, how it affects them in, in different ways. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Asian people, particularly Southeast Asian people, tend to have a lot of hypertrophic scarring. Mm -hmm. you know, in my experience more so than African Americans. It's another reason not to do that scar across the chest. Mm -hmm. Because that area where it goes across the sternum oftentimes can become very hypertrophic and keloided. And that's impossible to fix. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of sort of genetic variability and scar healing and scar formation that's important to touch on. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question kind of about that too. If if there is a scar that goes completely across, does that in any way weaken the skin from protecting that thoracic region of the chest? No, I don't think it weakens it. it if anything, it's the opposite. It makes it almost too tight. Oh, okay. okay. There's a lot of misunderstanding in the community of scars and flat closure. And we've seen all kinds of things. And somebody will say, well, my surgeon did this because I was larger. Or my surgeon never even told me. It just it just went across. Um, some some girls we know because of the tumor place, where the tumor was at, why they have the particular scars. And um, I'm sorry, go on. I lost. No, yeah, it's I'm coming out. So I, I, I was under the assumption large women had a straight across and the last one i saw it was on a very tiny woman like me she has a very small rib cage so it almost looked like it went around her entire i mean it was i didn't understand why it was and maybe it was her humor um but it's, yeah it's why a database, lots of misunderstand misinformation sometimes and misunderstanding it's why a database my phone's like, going off sorry it's important because that way you can kind of catalog different people um, and so people have more of an expectation of, you know, what their body mass index is and kind of what their result will be. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, sometimes if you've got, yeah, we said this before, you've got, let's say, a five foot, five inch woman with triple D breasts and she's 190 pounds, her results can be totally different than a five foot five woman who is 115 pounds, you know, and maybe never had children. You know, those are, those are two radically different uh, outcomes. I guess my last question is, you know, in this line of work of advocacy that we do, and you you know talk about those radically different outcomes. What what is what are some things that we can say to people that are getting ready to go flat? Yeah. That that's are asking like yeah your results may be different because you know we do have the online photo gallery that has all different body shapes and sizes and different scars and you know so people have more access to those pictures to take to the plastic surgeon but what is some advice that you could give us on what how we should like guide people in our community that are coming to us with those types of questions yeah i think that you know going and finding mm -hmm patients as close to you as possible mm -hmm. and even if you're, you don't like their result using that as a platform for discussion with your plastic surgeon is important you can say well this lady's similar to me you know i'm 5'8 170 pounds she looks like she's about the same but i don't like the way her scar is here you know is there anything that you can do to make that a little bit better at least there's more of an apples to apples comparison. You know, I think it's difficult as a plastic surgeon when somebody brings in a picture, you know, off of Google, and you know, I may be talking to a 47 year old woman, and they bring me a picture of a 25 year old. You know, obviously things are very different there, and it becomes an expectation issue. You spend a lot of the conversation kind of realigning expectations, and I think that. Um, from an advocacy standpoint, helping people appreciate, you know, kind of what their outcomes will be based on what other people like them have experienced is, uh, is probably a good way to begin. I like that. I never thought to have people take pictures of what they don't want to look like. <laughs> yeah. I, I find those more helpful than what they do want to look like. Do okay. You agree? Mm -hmm. I I provided three pictures. I provided what I wanted to look like, what I would accept, and what I would be angry about. Yeah, that's good. So, and I and I gave full reasons about each one. And so whenever anyone comes to me, that's what I tell them to do. I I I I'm glad you said that. I've not thought <laughs> I never thought that one through <laughs> seems like we're we're kind of done
Yeah. Yeah. We're, I think we're good. I think we're all like pooped out. <laughs> Oh, thank you, ladies. I'm glad we got the technical issues worked out. I think Erica popped off. I'll shoot her a text thanking her. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to do this I'm again. Here. And, uh, you see me? Yeah, I think it's a great conversation. Thank yeah. you guys so much. Can you hear me? We are just, we're so appreciative of your time. Um, are we uh, on the topic of having you as our um, advisor? We have our, um, our, letter with you our agreement letter is that we for some reason didn't realize that we put that we wouldn't tag you do we have your permission to be tagging you in our social media yeah of course and i'd appreciate okay. you to tag dr kochak also because you know we're we're partners and you know i a lot of times um you know if patients they want to see me or they want to see him, the way our practice is structured, we just kind of work very kind of hand in hand and it just keeps things more streamlined that way. And we actually, in, in that regard, we were hoping to, to that he would be here tonight because we wanted to kind of ask, I mean, it, would he be interested in also coming on as an advisor? He would be, he's at his kids. Uh, oh, she's at, uh, Erica's still on. Can you guys see me? Can you hear me? Because yeah, she's up, she's up in the corner. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Just, you can also uh, tag yeah, Midwest he, Breast. Yes, Do you guys yes he would be. He's at his kid's school for something tonight. Okay. 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 So we'll, 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 we'll contact you guys through email and, and send him a invite. That would be wonderful. Yeah. What social media uh, presence is your strong point? Say again. Uh, my question is, what social media presence is your uh, strong point? Erica, what social media presence is our strong point? <laughs> I'm sorry, you're, bu you're buffering. I can't hear the full question. I think she's got her mic turned up. Oops. Can you hear me? I can't hear her. It's probably huh. Instagram and Facebook. Okay. Um, I think it's yeah. probably more, it's becoming more Instagram, but I think traditionally it's been Facebook. Okay. okay. I, I, I tagged, I, I did a tag specifically with you guys I think yesterday or the day before. Well, thank you. Um, on my personal one, because I knew that flat closure hadn't had an agreement with you to be able to do that. So I was like, well, I'll just do it on my own personal account then. <laughs> Yeah, so. Well, I, and you know, it's been great. You girls That's me. <laughs> <laughs> there I am. Uh, yeah. Do you girls have a chance to ask them again? What's that? Yes. Hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it. It's it's the it's the terminology. Did we talk to him about the terminology? Mm -hmm. Yes, my yes, mic. Yes. I'm sorry. So, so we did. Um, I have been did dropping. you ask him about? I've been dropping the thread of our YouTube's um, in private messages and groups when they've talked about certain things, and I know that we've had that subject come up. I have been dropping the YouTube links in there and. You know, I know that they're lengthy, but uh, quite a few people were really grateful to have to have these um, to listen to. So it's just it's really great that we're doing this together. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's really informative. And I think that, you know, you mentioned earlier that you don't really get a chance to talk to patients this way. Yeah. And patients that we talk to feel the same and that they don't have, you know, these hour long time periods to just sit and talk to their surgeon and ask questions. And so us being able to ask you questions and have you answer them and then bring it back to the community, community is really grateful too. How many yeah. people do you have yeah. in your community now? So the last time I counted all of the groups, um, there was over 12,000. But I know that that's grown now because there is, you know, a B breast implant illness um group that's gotten pretty 
going a going flat after um, breast implant illness focused explanting focused which has gained a lot of followers very fast um, and then I also recently joined a group that's an English based group so that has a real lot of members so I'm gonna say the last I'm gonna say with those, it's probably more like fourteen thousand. Wow, that's a lot. At, yeah, I mean, Melly's group, just Melly's group, has one hundred and twenty. I know that the other the other group that that we're admitting for um, that Emily Hopper has is got one thousand three hundred at least so it's a lot that's awesome all right ladies yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to and get i'm in the mess to support all right wonderful Thanks. wait so, um,